Hello everyone, my name is Christina Roldan, and I'm a second year medical student here at the University of Miami Miller School of Medicine in Florida. Ever since I was young, I knew that I had to seek out ways to grow in my faith. I was a believer, I had certainty of salvation, and when I was away in college at the University of Pennsylvania, I was able to find community of that sort, intentionally seeking it out, and I found it. And when I came to medical school, I was once again looking for that community where I would be able to get plugged in and be able to grow more in my faith with fellow believers in medicine. Well, about halfway through my first year of medical school, an opportunity came around for me to actually serve in leadership. God was telling me things. He was telling me that now it was my turn to give back and not only receive. And it has been a beautiful thing at that. We've had amazing discussions with our fellow students and faculty and grow together as a community here. So I'd like to leave you listener with a message today, one of pondering perhaps. If you're considering taking on a leadership position and are perhaps a little hesitant to do so, consider it. It may be an unexpected blessing that you were not even aware of. Have a wonderful day. Thanks for listening. Hi, this is Dr. Mike Chupp, and you are listening to CMDA Matters, the weekly podcast of the Christian Medical and Dental Associations. Well, you just heard from Christina Roldan, a medical student who I had the pleasure of meeting last month at the 2022 CMDA National Convention. Christina and her brother James made quite an impression with their special music during one of our plenary sessions. It was so exciting to see so many healthcare students join us at the convention this year. You know, 91 years ago, when George Peterson and Kenneth Geezer first met in their dorm rooms at Northwestern University Medical School, I bet they had no idea how God was about to use their desire to remain strong in their faith as they navigated the rigorous training process of medical school. CMDA's story has always been one of faith as well as service and a collective commitment to biblical values that now weave together a Christian community of more than 16,000 healthcare professionals. Our conversation this week with Dr. Paul Roos shows that we face different challenges than Dr. Peterson and Dr. Geezer faced back in 1931, but as a community working together, God is certainly using CMDA in powerful ways to encourage and inspire the next generation of healthcare professionals. That's why I've been asking for your help this month to help claim the entire $320,000 matching gift by June 30th. Christian healthcare professionals are under attack in our world and the challenges for Christian students who gather on a campus today are extremely intense. However, God is on our side, and working together, your CMDA will have many more years of seeing lives transformed for God's glory. I'm happy to share with you that just over $96,000 has been given toward that $320,000 match. Thank you to all of you who are helping to lead the way in claiming this matching gift. I am greatly encouraged as I think about the ministries that will be able to remain strong because of your generosity. As you consider your gift, please let our stewardship team know if they can answer questions or assist you in any way. They can be reached at 888-230-2637 or by email using stewardship at cmda.org. You can also give online. Just visit cmda.org slash give. Well, our guest today is Dr. Paul Roos, who was also one of our featured breakout speakers during our recent national convention back in April in Indianapolis, Indiana. We asked him to join us this week to take a deeper dive into the discussion 
concerning the way that transgender ideology is impacting women in sports and how gender-affirming treatment continues to challenge the very concept of fairness in female sports. I was traveling last week to visit our CMDA ministry in Buffalo, New York, so Vice President of Bioethics and Public Policy, Dr. Jeff Barrows, very kindly and capably hosted this discussion with Dr. Roos. Let's listen in. This is Dr. Jeff Barrows, Senior Vice President for Bioethics and Public Policy, sitting in for Dr. Mike Chupp, who is away traveling on business. I'm very happy to welcome to the podcast today, Dr. Paul Roos. Dr. Roos got his undergraduate degree at Marquette University and then went on to get a PhD and a medical degree from the Medical College of Wisconsin. He then traveled to St. Louis to the University of Washington to go through his pediatric residency, followed by a fellowship in pediatric endocrinology. Dr. Ruse also has a certification in healthcare ethics from the National Catholic Bioethics Center. Dr. Ruse is an associate professor of pediatrics, endocrinology, and diabetes, and an associate professor of cell biology and physiology at Washington University School of Medicine in St. Louis. He has received numerous academic honors and awards, and I should also say is co-chair of our CMDA Sexuality and Gender Identity Task Force, along with Dr. Andre Van Maal. Welcome to CMDA Matters, Dr. Ruse. It's my pleasure to be here with you this afternoon. Well, at our recent national convention, which uh, was just a few weeks ago, you gave a workshop talking about the sex differences in athletic performance between males and females. But before I get into the actual question itself, I do want our listeners to know that most people, when they are giving a workshop, they stay and they take advantage of the rest of the meeting. But you had to take call that weekend. But in spite of that, you didn't let that stop you. I should let our listeners know that you drove out the same day of the workshop, I guess a, a distance of a of about four hours. You gave a one-hour workshop, and then you turned around, got in your car, and went back to St. Louis. And I just want you to know that those of us who found out about all those logistics were very impressed with your dedication and commitment to giving this workshop, and I wanted our listeners to know about that. And your talk was excellent, and anyone who registered for the conference and wasn't able to attend this particular conference workshop, I would encourage them to watch the recording, which should be made available on our website in the near future. But getting to the question itself, in the talk you gave, you showed a slide detailing the actual percent advantage on various sports. That absolutely fascinated me. I was surprised at the amount of data and how, how detailed it was. And so if you would just talk a little bit about how that data was collected and how they measured the various performance differences between men and women. I'm happy to do so. You know, in there, there's quite a bit of data actually uh, published in the literature with these uh, sex differences between males and females in athletic competition. The actual slide that I presented was from a, a review article in which they took publicly available uh, information from databases or uh, looking at uh, tournament and competition records. So looking at people in athletic competition at various levels and uh, uniformly uh, were able to demonstrate uh, these uh, differences between male and female athletes. And although that figure, you know, looks more at, at uh, more elite competition and, and those that are, are well-trained, those same differences, uh, you know, really occur at, at really all levels, uh, even in, in uh, people at uh, high school levels and grade school competitions. So a lot to delve in there, but uh, what, what's striking about it is that's very cons consistent. And, and you know, as I showed in, in that uh, slide, the differences in, in activities such as swimming 
you know, is about 10 to 15 percent. And a lot of, you know, the concern recently came up with the uh, Leah Thomas uh, story with the NCAA. But, you know, the, the differences in, in some things such as, you know, baseball, the ability to uh, pitch, you know, is as much as 50 percent. So, yeah, much, much uh, information to be gleaned uh, from that. But it's all publicly available and, and really, you know, uncontroversial. This is this is well documented. Well, in that same workshop, you go on to talk about how sex differences are expressed throughout every cell in the body through epigenetics, as well as variations in gene expression, especially relating to muscle cells. And this occurs completely separate, I understand, from the sex hormones themselves. And I don't think many of us, I'm an older generation healthcare professional, did my medical school training in the 70s, uh, in the dark ages. So I, I know that there are many of us that aren't aware of this. So could you go into some detail about this a little bit more? Well, so, you know, I, I will say that, that there are effects of the sex hormones that do affect gene transcription. So it's not to minimize that uh, as, as a fact. Factor, but it's to recognize that that the differences between male and female are present really from the time of conception, from the earliest stage of, of human development. And we know this in, in other areas. It's a whole field of medicine uh, in which we look at sex-specific uh, differences and disease susceptibility and response to medications. So the changes that, that are, occur uh, in males versus females, a lot of it is, is driven by the developmental programming uh, that occurs even before before a child is born. And the DNA itself, the sequence, uh, you can get changes in the DNA uh, that don't change the genetic code itself, but you can chemically modify uh, the various uh, genes. And there are, are proteins um, that um, and uh, chemical modifications. The, the two most important are, are known as uh, DNA methylation, putting methyl groups on, on various bases, and histone acetylation. And histones are, are proteins that uh, help to um, uh, wind the DNA, and uh, there needs to be an unwinding uh, to occur for that uh, transcription or the, the reading of that genetic information. So, and these are present in every cell of the body, and they're present throughout life. And there will be effects from the sex steroid hormones, but many of these differences are, are completely independent of that. And, and we see them in situations where um, you, you can directly compare, you know, sex hormone uh, levels. Uh, so, Well, that really gets then into our next question, because that really goes not so much against, but it, it really kind of exposes some of the fallacies of the stances of the NCAA and the International Olympic Committee, because they seem to think that all that is necessary to equalize the performance between a male and a female is to eliminate, for instance, testosterone for a period of time. And then according to them, all the quote sex differences are eliminated in their view. But you're saying this is not true. And you did an excellent job in the workshop detailing the many other differences between males and females beyond the sex hormones. So uh, first of all, how do you feel about this stance of the NCAA and the IOC? And, and could you review some of the basic physiologic differences between the sexes that impact athletic performance above and beyond the sex hormone levels? Yes, you know, so, it's true that that the sex hormones and specifically testosterone adds to that competitive advantage. It certainly is very important in in programming and in changing the body mass and and for muscle strength. There are many caveats to that, however, that do not go away uh, when you remove that influence of, of that uh, testosterone. Some of that has to do with the way the body developed uh, during puberty, so that the change in, in bone size, for example, uh, lung size, uh, heart uh, function, uh, these are changes that are structural and uh, in addition to, to the functional changes, and depending on the sport that you're talking about, can have profound influences in how one is going to be able to compete. And these happen, uh, you know, very early on. Uh, the the uh, programming for that can happen even in the first year of life. And so it's not to minimize the effect of, of testosterone and, and the sex steroids in athletic performance, but it's really to draw attention to the fact that there's much more going on. And it's, it can be more dramatic depending on, on the actual sport that one is participating in. I think the effort of the NCAA and the IOC in focusing on testosterone, it's perhaps a well-intentioned you know, focus, but it really 
doesn't get at what the science says. And, and if you ask any physiologist, exercise physiologist, or anyone who knows um, you know, details about the uh, human biology, it's readily apparent that that is not the only effect. And the question of, of what uh, constitutes you know, fairness and how much of a difference. So for example, somebody, uh, a male uh, athlete uh, that is uh, put on medications to, to lower testosterone levels is going to experience a, a drop in athletic performance. But uh, as, as I showed in the workshop, uh, because of these other factors, the structural changes in, in the body and, and some of these hormone independent effects, uh, there's going to be a very, very significant residual uh, advantage uh, in that uh, male athlete. I found that absolutely fascinating. Well, at, at the end of your workshop, you, you had a conclusion that the participation of male athletes in female sports brings up not only the issues of fairness, but also of safety. So could you elaborate on what type of safety issues you're thinking of? Yes, uh, there, there are many, you know, safety issues, and, and we can look at it from both directions. So there's uh, questions of safety, for example, in many contact sports, that the body mass is very different uh, in males versus females. And if we think about some of the physics of what conveys that competitive advantage, for example, boxing, the uh, force and velocity that can be generated by a male athlete is uh, significantly greater uh, than that uh, of a female athlete. And, and so, so very significant uh, uh, potential for, for injury. It, when we look at uh, ligamentous uh, structure, for example, uh, being subjected to, to the same uh, stresses, uh, much uh, greater potential for, for injuring, for example, the knee uh, joint you know, in, in, in this, these competitions. And part of it is, is uh, related uh, to just the actual uh, physics and the biology of, of, of the body itself. And then you also then have to factor in, um, you know, the effects of, of what is being attempted by uh, manipulating hormone levels and how that affects the body in adverse ways. And this gets beyond even sports competitions uh, so that a, a, a female uh, or even a male athlete for, for that uh, matter, matter that uh, has been engaged in, in manipulating hormone levels to be able to have this gender affirmation can have, for example, a very significant uh, differences in, in bone mineral density, uh, risk of fracture. So it, it runs the gamut and it, it, it can be very different uh, depending on the sport. And there are, are perhaps some sports uh, where that'll be less of a factor. In virtually all of the contact sports, uh, you know, I think that this is uh, well established and, and there are uh, some examples already of these types of injuries occurring, and it, it you know, tends to be minimized uh, in the efforts to uh, to try to justify these um, you know, sports policies that are being put forward. Um, but it is it is something that, as you said, is is beyond just the the fairness of the competition. It really puts the uh, the athletes at risk. Well, that that really gets to what I was next going to address, and this is a little bit of a a topic change, but. Uh, we at CMDA, especially within our advocacy department, are actively engaged in promoting laws that prohibit these, quote, transition therapies, especially in minors uh, that are using puberty blockers, GNRH agonists, as well as cross-sex hormones in the adolescent population. And you alluded to a little bit some of the problems with calcium. And, and my understanding from what I am reading and seeing from those that are promoting these, quote, transition therapies, they, they seem to imply that you put a, a young adolescent on a GANRH agonist, and then when you stop them, everything goes back to normal. It's, it's just as if you've just delayed things a little bit and there are no other effects of that. But I don't think that's true. Uh, and I'd like you to elaborate maybe on some of the complications that can arise when these potent drugs are used for adolescent purposes, uh, for adolescents for the purpose of this, quote, gender transition. Yeah, I, I think you really uh, very concisely put forward the arguments, uh, you know, for using these uh, interventions, uh, you know, that it's described as being safe and, and certainly for the puberty blockers, uh, the GNRH agonists uh, being fully reversible. And really all the claims that are being made in that regard are really not based upon uh, sound scientific evidence. In fact, we have lots of evidence um, and even just plain logic uh, that that contradicts that. So, you know, related to, to the effects of, of blocking normally timed puberty, one one cannot say that it's a reversible process when you're interrupting a temporally dependent process. So the timing of puberty uh, is very well established. And if you suspend that pubertal development for a period of time, even if you 
uh, remove the medication and allow those signals from the brain to tell the gonad to work, you can't buy back that time. And there are many things that happen in that critical window. Some of the, uh, so those uh, changes are, are developmental. We talk about the biological changes of puberty, changing the body from uh, the, the childlike state to the uh, sec, uh, reproductively competent adult uh, state. Um, but it's also developmentally a very important time of life. And, and we know that puberty happens at the time of, of adolescence, uh, where an individual is, is learning how to be independent, how to interact with their peers, uh, independent of their parents. And, and this dissociation, again, you know, cannot be reversed. Now, speaking in, in regards to, to uh, sports biology, the timing of the adolescent years, uh, actually uh, extending into the early 20s, is a critical time of bone development and actually the accrual of maximal bone density. And from that point onward, all the way through the rest of life, it's going to be a downward slope as far as if you start at a lower level um, in your early 20s, you're at a significantly uh, increased risk of osteoporosis later in life. And there's no way uh, that we know that you can make that up. And so by delaying that puberty, uh, you're losing that opportunity. Now, the argument that's often made is that um, by blocking puberty, if then you then um, transition and continue on to cross sex hormones, that you're going to reverse that effect. And you do see a partial uh, benefit uh, from the sex steroids uh, in bone mineral density, but there's a number of studies uh, that have shown that you may not be able to, to make up all of the deficit that was induced with significant risk. And we really don't have long-term data in treated uh, children and adolescence. It just hasn't been used long enough to look at some of these long-term outcomes. And then when we think about uh, not only the um, and the puberty blockers uh, independent of, of on the bones, the sex steroid hormones are very important uh, in the brain and, and in brain development. We know that there's very significant changes that occur structurally and, and functionally because of the sex steroid hormones. And what we don't know is that if you interfere with that normal signaling process at that critical time of life, you know what the implications are going to be. It really is an unknown, uh, and there's many reasons to be concerned about that. Um, we can say a lot more about about the effects of, of the cross sex hormones themselves. You know that um, the. Uh, altering of testosterone and estrogen. If you think back to that very first question that you asked about the epigenetics and the differences, you know, in the genet genetic aspects of, of how genes are turned on and off uh, in males versus females, that if one gives testosterone to a biological female, it's not the same thing as, as testosterone exposure for a biological male. And the response to that hormone is not going to be the same. And, and it's already emerging that there are many adverse effects, uh, for example, on, on risk of diabetes, uh, cardiovascular heart disease, a change in body composition, again, the effects on, on lean versus uh, fat mass, which really uh, should give one a significant pause and, and certainly would counteract the assertion that this is a, a benign intervention or even a beneficial invention. And, and again, you know, looking at the whole reason for giving that, there's much more we could say, but related to the, the issue of, of hormone exposure, even the data that we have right now raises many concerns and many of the, the uh, adverse effects are known and many of them um, have yet to be studied. Well, I don't know if you, I assume you are a member of the Pediatric Endocrine Society. And let me quote something they have on their website. Uh, and I am quoting, medical intervention for transgender youth and adults, including puberty suppression, hormone therapy, and medically indicated surgery is effective, relatively safe, when appropriately monitored, and has been established as the standard of care. Federal and private insurers should cover such interventions as prescribed by a physician, as well as the appropriate medical screenings that are recommended for all body tissues that a person may have. Now you've just gone through the fact that there is some science that says this can be dangerous and there's really very little good science supporting this statement. So if the science doesn't support this particular statement by the Pediatric Endocrine Society, why did they make this statement? 
one has to question, you know, where this is coming from. And, and uh, many of the uh, advocacy groups that are present within these societies are the ones that are putting this forward. In fact, the Endocrine Society, in their publication, the first one came out in 2009, and they had a revision in 2017, does not make the claim that they're standards of care. And in fact, they, they're very careful in the actual publication to say that they are not, and they're put forward as guidelines. And uh, they make some effort to be able to acknowledge the quality or lack of quality evidence uh, that's present in these guidelines. And they have a grading system and they, they acknowledge that most of the recommendations are based on uh, low or very low quality evidence. It's actually the World Professional Association for Transgender Health, WPATH, that has consistently, they've, they've taken it upon themselves to, to call these standards of care really arbitrarily. It's, 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 a, it's a designation that they have put forward really without a, a basis for doing so. And we know from past experience that, that many guidelines, medical practice guidelines that have come forward based on this type of low quality evidence are found later to be wrong. And uh, the recommendations uh, when that the higher quality data becomes available are, are drastically different. And in the absence of the information that's present, now it, it, it does address the fact that these individuals are suffering and they need assistance in, in managing the dysphoria and, and many of the difficulties uh, that they experience. And in an attempt to, to provide help uh, to these individuals, really what we do uh, in, in all other areas of medicine, which we, we pride ourselves on, on evidence-based, uh, we talk about uh, evidence-based medicine. If we were confronted with this degree of uncertainty, this degree of really fairly significant uh, interventions that would have that will have long lasting implications on fertility and and you know sexual function and these other risk factors uh, there would be a much greater degree of caution and to be able to acknowledge the deficiencies and perhaps uh, efforts uh, directed toward uh, alternative approaches. And, and really any attempt to, to, to do something different than the medical affirmation model is often from an ideological basis, not from a scientific basis, uh, shut down. Uh, and one uh, is often told that they can't even ask the questions about uh, alternative ways uh, to alleviate suffering in these individuals. And so there are many problems, and I think it's largely driven by an ideology. And it, you know, if we talk about it from the, the, the scientific perspective, maybe in, in scientific language, um, you know, what are the, the premises uh, that are being put forward as far as the basis for these in, interventions? And, and one, I, I think, can very clearly identify many problems and propose alternative ways to really achieve, or at least attempt to achieve that goal of, of alleviating suffering. One striking point that I have found in my reading on this, and I'd like to see if you agree, but if you take children that have gender dysphoria and you don't do anything other than supportive care and follow them through uh, what would be for them a normal puberty, that there is a spontaneous resolution rate of about, uh, depending on the study, but on average about 85%, uh, meaning that if you're giving a a therapy, especially one that has uh, significant potential side effects, you're giving it unnecessarily. Is that is that your understanding that the spontaneous resolution rate is around 80, 85 percent? Certainly for um, the original population where many of the uh, pioneering, we should say, studies, you know, that were proposing gender affirmation, it's a consistent uh, observation. In fact, there was a, a Ken Zucker uh, and his uh, former graduate student, uh, Singh, published just very recently a paper that really uh, came to that same conclusion uh, with a relatively large uh, cohort. All of the data, you know, has its own limitations, but it, it's a consistent finding. And uh, in medicine, you know, we talk about non-inferior Priority, meaning that if you're proposing a new intervention, it has to be at least as good, if not better, uh, than the prevailing approach. And, and again, this is, comes back from an ideological uh, argument about whether having somebody realign their gender identity uh, with their biological sex is a desired outcome. And from a medical uh, standpoint, whether you desire it or not, those that have that outcome 
are not subjected to these uh, interventions uh, with all of the attendant uh, risks, uh, some known and some unknown, and they're not going to be tethered to the medical establishment for the rest of their life. And so, you know, from a, a non-ideological standpoint, uh, one could argue very strongly that this is a good outcome. Yet from an ideological standpoint, one does not want to accept that if they're promoting this uh, sex discordant gender identity model. The other thing to say about that is, is that, again, the, the epidemiology, the demographics of what we're seeing now is, is changing. And so rather than having, you know, the data that, that shows that high desistance rate really applies to children that presented pre-pubertally with uh, this uh, sex discordant gender identity. And then as they progress on through puberty, that is a defining moment for them uh, as far as uh, coming to that reconciliation of, of their biology and what they perceive as their identity. What we're seeing now are, are adolescents and, and predominantly adolescent females that are presenting without any prior uh, evidence of any uh, sex gender identity discordance. And the literature there is even more sparse. And uh, we're, we're starting to see already uh, that there are individuals that have gone forward with these affirmation approaches only to discover that it didn't solve their underlying problems. And so there's there's really a lack of good data and we, we have to you know have lots of caution in how we look at the literature. But this outcome is, uh, and there's no, I should also add that there is not a single diagnostic procedure, a biological test that one can use to identify uh, the 85% who are going to uh, have this uh, outcome of desistance uh, from the, the small percentage, you know, 5, 10, 15%, uh, they're going to have persistence. And we don't, we also know that because of the affirmation approach, uh, very few, if any, of uh, the youth uh, that are experiencing this condition are really in that, that setting uh, that leads to desistance. And so many of the studies now that are coming out, uh, once you uh, give a puberty blocker, nearly all of the individuals in, in a stark contrast to the prior data will go on to get cross-sex hormones. And, you know, one argues that they had all, uh, great precision in identifying those people who would benefit. But I think there's a very strong and, and much better hypothesis that the intervention itself is changing that outcome, that trajectory. So rather than being a pause button for these individuals, they're actually locking them in to the sex discordant gender identity into later stages of, of intervention. Well, I know we're running short on time, but I'd love to hear your your thoughts, because many of our listeners are pediatricians, primary care physicians that may in fact run into some of these, these sisters that, that have uh, been on puberty blockers and have started cross-sex hormones and then recognize, as you mentioned, that this is not working for them. So what recommendations would you make for these practitioners, these healthcare professionals that encounter an adolescent on cross-sex hormones? Would you have them take them off right away or taper? What would you say to them? Yeah, throughout our, our, our conversation, you know, we've, we've talked about, you know, operating from a standpoint of having very little data. And uh, this is an area where we, we have very, very little information, but we have some understanding of the effects uh, when normal uh, sex hormone exposure is interrupted. And, and we do know that a very uh, marked and, and abrupt changes can have very uh, serious consequences and, and, and not only physically, but also from a psychological standpoint. And so, just as uh, when we're trying to help an individual that is not able to go through puberty, that has, for example, a condition known as hypogonadotropic hypogonadism, independent of puberty blockers, that we normally uh, begin at low hormone levels and gradually increase them to the adult levels to allow their body to adjust. That's likely to be a prudent course of action for those that are coming off of the hormones to be able to uh, wean them off uh, within a, a, a period of time rather than stopping them abroad likely to uh, help to minimize uh, some of those uh, very important physiologic changes that are going to occur uh, both uh, within, you know, from bodily and also psychologically. And the other, the other aspect I would add as well, um, you know, the need for these individuals to be able to interact with their physicians and develop that relationship and to get that support, not only within their, their primary you know, care provider and their specialists, um, but I, I would say then all of their supports, um, you know, to be able to journey with them, to be able to enter into this, the, the experience that they had uh, and why with them in, in that uh, process because 
many of the difficulties that are experienced, even when an individual recognizes that this did not solve um, the underlying problem, uh, there are some uh, persistent problems that do need to be addressed. And, and so to be able to provide that support for them as they navigate uh, this complex landscape that is influenced partially by the, uh, the hormone interventions, but also um, by the underlying uh, reason for why they sought this as a solution to their distress. Very good advice. Well, one of the foundational scripture verses in my bioethics program at Trinity, and likely a foundational verse for you and your ethics study, was Genesis 127, where God says, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. So I want to thank you, Dr. Ruse, for bringing clarity and scientific support of the fact that there are only two biological sexes and that they are very different. This is a very important tool and excellent information for our listeners. So thank you for being with us today. Well, thank you for having this very, very important conversation. Well, at CMDA, we have been pushing back and resisting this transgender ideology that's forcing its way into so many aspects of our culture today. And we continue to push back by speaking biblical truth as well as medical science in the media and state legislatures and at the federal level. Just last week, we put out a news release responding to inaccurate claims made by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services by the Assistant Secretary, Rachel Levine, in a recent NPR interview. Dr. Levine stated, quote, there is no argument among medical professionals, whether pediatricians, pediatric endocrinologists, adolescent medicine physicians, adolescent psychiatrists, psychologists, etc., about the value and the importance of gender-affirming care, end quote. Well, as we said in our news release, this is a deeply egregious and disturbing false claim attempting to force the public into believing that all healthcare professionals support gender-affirming care. Well, in fact, gender-affirming care, especially for minors, is not supported by the best scientific evidence and should not be promoted by our federal government. Believing it is the only option puts already at risk youth at even greater risk. As Christian healthcare professionals, we feel a strong obligation to provide ethical as well as evidence-based care for all of our patients, especially those struggling with gender identity. And we have that same obligation to do so with sensitivity and compassion consistent with the humility and love that Christ modeled and commanded us to show all people as his followers. This blatant omission and apparent ignorance of differing viewpoints by Assistant Secretary Levine is alarming and frankly inexcusable, especially because it shows a complete disregard for the full body of medical research, which offers a vastly different conclusion. As our discussion with Dr. Ruz shows, There's no question that gender identity issues are complex. However, medicine is being undermined by government mandates that seek to impose a new ideology just by the sheer force of government power rather than unbiased examination of all of the scientific data. And stuck in the middle, well, there are our patients who need help. Accepting gender-affirming care as the standard of care is a prescription for bad medicine. Since 2016, CMDA has been involved in a federal lawsuit fighting against the so-called transgender mandate that was included within the Affordable Care Act that requires healthcare professionals like us to perform gender transition procedures on any patient, and that includes children. Well, back in August 2021, we received a permanent injunction from a federal court affirming the religious freedom, the right of all current and future CMDA members to avoid participating in gender transitions as well as abortions. The case itself is still ongoing, but our members are protected by the injunction even as it works its way through the appeal process. And please, 
I want to encourage you to share this information with your colleagues who are not yet members of CMDA and encourage them to join us. This injunction protects future members as well. So now is the right time to join CMDA to protect your healthcare right of conscience. You can find out more information at cmda.org slash transgender mandate. If you haven't yet checked out CMDA's ethics statement on transgender identification, then please take the time to do so soon. These statements are designed to provide you with biblical, ethical, social, as well as scientific understanding of a variety of bioethical issues through concise statements that have been articulated in a compassionate and caring manner by experts. Plus, we have started offering continuing education credits with several of these more recent statements. So you can earn credits in our CMDA Learning Center by reviewing the statement on transgender identification. You can find these statements at cmda.org ethics, and you can also earn credits at cmda.org slash learning center. If you'd like to hear more from Dr. Ruse, we actually have a perfect opportunity for you. CMDA has been partnering with the Hendricks Center at Dallas Theological Seminary, and we have an upcoming in-person conference called Critical Conversations on Identity and Gender. Dr. Ruse is actually one of our plenary speakers at this conference. Cultural norms have rapidly changed. Sometimes it makes my head spin, as has our ability to meaningfully dialogue with those shifts. Nowhere is this truer than in discussions about gender and sexuality. Medical as well as pastoral care face a daunting task in the midst of discussions about transgenderism and choices about sexual preference, especially when theological reflections on how we are made by God are deliberately left to the side. As Christians, how do we speak effectively, truthfully, and graciously while giving care in such an environment? Please join us for this critical conversation as we consider the theology, science, legal counsel, and pastoral care required to serve people well as individual caregivers and fellow members of society. You can join us live in Dallas, Texas, or virtually. It'll be August 5th and 6th. You can register at cmda.org slash events today. Well, I'm excited to tell you that next week we have another video podcast, and our guest is none other than the president of the Colson Center for Christian Worldview, Mr. John Stone Street, who's the co-host of the Breakpoint podcast. We're going to be discussing how conscience rights are important both inside and outside of healthcare. Be sure to come back next week for this important interview. As always, if you want to suggest a future guest for our podcast, you can just email us, cmda matters at cmda.org. And if you like the podcast, please be sure to give us a five-star rating and share us on your favorite social media platform. As I conclude this week's episode, I want to share the scripture verse that Dr. Barrows referenced near the end of his conversation with Dr. Ruz. The message translation of Genesis 127 reads, God created human beings. He created them godlike, reflecting God's nature. He created them male and female. As Jeff said, this verse brings clarity and scientific support to the fact that there are truly only two biological sexes. And it also reminds us that all human beings are created in the image of God, Imago Dei. All human beings are our neighbors and they are to be loved by us as we love ourselves. All human beings possess intrinsic dignity and are worthy of equal respect and concern from us as healthcare professionals. So remember that important distinction as you help patients who are dealing with these most complex issues. 
And as you respond with grace and civility and love, you are bringing the hope and healing of Christ to the world around you. That's what matters supremely to CMDA and CMDA Matters. We'll see you next week, Jehovah willing. This podcast has been a production of the Christian Medical and Dental Associations. The opinions expressed by guests on this podcast are not necessarily endorsed by the Christian Medical and Dental Associations. CMDA is a nonpartisan organization that does not endorse political parties or candidates for public office. The views expressed on this podcast reflect judgments regarding principles and values held by CMDA and its members and are not intended to imply endorsement of any political party or candidate.